In this video lecture, we're going to talk about Java's exception handling abilities, which we'll see are quite similar to C++'s exception handling capabilities, with a few syntactic differences and also a few more substantive differences. If you're looking for good notes on this uh, subject, uh, Scott's book, Section 8.5, has good uh, information, as well as my notes on exception handling and Oracle's exception handling tutorial. We're going to start by actually looking at Java's exception hierarchy and then go into some of the syntax. So the very top level class in Java for exception handling is the throwable class. And this actually comes from java.lang, so you do not have to import anything. It's part of the library you get when you start up Java. Throwable has two primary subclasses, error and exception. Error is for catastrophic errors that are not meant to be caught. The Java Virtual Machine will terminate your program when these errors are received. A couple of examples of that are out of heat space, and Stack Overflow, for example, if you had an infinitely recursive procedure. Exceptions are um, objects that allow us to recover from errors that have been made. And there are two types of exception classes. There is the runtime exception class. This really should be all one word, but I can't put it all in one line and what you've already seen, the I.O. exception class. So these are two predefined classes in Java. The runtime exception class encompasses errors that one expects to receive at runtime, such as a null pointer exception, or division by zero, or array index out of bounds. There are, of course, many others. And I.O. exception, you've already seen uh, certain things such as the file does not exist. Or you may lack permission. Or if you're not careful, you may try to read past the end of file. Now, Java differs in the way it handles the runtime exception and the I.O. exception. Runtime exceptions are not checked by the compiler, which means that your procedure is not required to handle them, nor tell Java that it's not handling them. In contrast, with I.O. exceptions and exceptions in general, you must tell the Java compiler either I'm handling the exception, and you'll do that by putting a catch clause into your method, or else you will use a throw statement uh, at the top of the method to tell Java that you're throwing out of it. And we will get to that uh, when we get to the PowerPoint slides. Error also does not require any kind of special uh, messages because we're sp not supposed to catch them. So there, there should be no catch clauses for them. Now, if you're going to be creating your own user classes, you should be subclassing exception. And finally, Throwable has three useful methods for us. Print stack trace. So you've already seen an example, I'm sure many times already, of print stack trace when you've had some kind of error in your Java program. Get message will return a message describing the error, and toString will also return a message describing the error, but tends to be a little more chatty or informative about what kind of errors. 
So let's just quickly take a look at Java program and explore some of the kinds of errors that we might see. So we'll start out with a very simple program. In fact, we don't need this try. All we're doing here is assigning x the result of trying to parse a string. And as you can see, it's not going to be successful because we're not going to be able to convert Brad to an integer. So if we compile this and run it, you see that we get a Java Lang number format exception. It says for input string Brad, and then it gives us a stack trace. So this, in fact, is using the print stack trace method as the default for what happens. And what's happening here is because we did not handle the exception, the exception got propagated out of foo and into main, but since main didn't handle it, it got sent to the Java virtual machine, and the Java virtual machine's default behavior is to print the stack trace. Let's say that we instead decided to handle it. In order to handle it, we would have to put it inside a try catch statement whose syntax is just like C++. So in this case, I'm just going to connect, uh, catch a generic exception, and I'm going to experiment. We'll just try printing out e.get message. Okay, and we'll come down here and compile it and run it. And you can see that we got a full uh, message here from Java uh, with a stack trace. So now let's go and try just printing two string instead. And see what happens. And you see it was much less chatty. So I was wrong before. I said that uh, two string was more chatty. It's actually get message that's the chattier one. So here we just see number format exception and for the input string Brad, but no stack trace like we got with get message. Now let's show you that we could instead handle this exception in the main rather than in foo, the constructor. So we could say here try new foo and the catch and if we do the compilation we've again caught it except now we caught it in main rather than in foo. So parseInt is an example of a runtime exception. Let's now experiment with creating our own exception. I'll just call it dbz exception. And I'll give it one uh, instance variable for grint, which I'll initialize to 10. And in fact, I won't even bother right now to give it a constructor. I will say that it extends exception. And you'll see that this is a so-called checked uh, exception by the compiler. So we will get rid of this statement for the time being, and we will try to throw. And now you'll see that we have to say new. And the reason we have to say new is because there's no stack allocated objects in Java. So in C++, I told you not to do this because of the danger of some catch clause failing to deallocate the object. But since Java has garbage collection, um, this is fine. Ultimately, when a catch clause is done with it, there'll be no further references to this instance, and it will get um, discarded or recollected by the garbage. So down here, I'm going to get rid of my... Um, try statement. So all I have right now is an attempt to throw new BBZ exception. So I will compile it. And now I get an error message. It says error unreported exception foo.exception must be caught or declared to be thrown. So this is what I was referring to earlier. If you choose not to handle the exception, then you have to use a throws 
uh, keyword to indicate that you're throwing. And if you were throwing more than one, you could say, for example, number not found exception or something. It would be a comma separated list. But here, we're just going to throw BVZ exception. So that tells it that we're not going to handle it. Well, it's still not happy. It's now saying at 10, illegal start of expression, blah, blah, blah. And its issue, actually the issue is So I'll try compiling it, and I get an error still, unreported exception, but it says now for new foo at line 11. So this is actually, as you can see, it's in main. And the issue is main, even though it doesn't throw an exception, it's calling a method foo that throws a BVZ exception. So I ha am responsible not just for the exceptions I throw, but for the exceptions that my methods throw. And this is important enough that we're going to write it down here. So each method is responsible for both the exceptions it throws and any unhandled exceptions thrown by functions it calls. And part of the reason that Java is so um, intent on making you declare which exceptions you are not handling is to force you to think about which exceptions you have and to go through them carefully and make sure you know whether you want to throw them out of the function or whether you should be handling them and by making you also responsible for your sub functions it is making sure that you're going through all possible cases. So here I could fix this problem in one of two ways. I can uh, also say I'm not going to handle it. That will be fine and dandy with the Java compiler. In this case I'm basically passing the buck to the virtual machine. The virtual machine knows what to do with it. So if I run it you see exception in thread main bvz exception um, I didn't do anything for my two strings, so there's just the default of printing out the class name. Now, I could have, in either place, handled the exception. So let's say up here I decided to handle the exception. I would have to, again, use a try block. So whenever I want to handle an exception, it requires that I use a try block. In this case, I'll be explicit that it's a BVZ exception. And I have to always provide the exception object even if I don't use it. Um, typically, we do. So here I'm just going to say system, well, let's do something different. System.out.println um, handling in foo. Okay, so I'm not even using E, but unlike C++, I still must provide E as a parameter. So I can again compile this, and run it, and you can see it got handled in foo. And similarly I trust you could figure out how to make main handle this exception if need be. The last thing we're going to talk about is something called the finally clause. The finally clause is a clause that gets executed regardless of whether we succeed or not succeed in our um, try statement. So I'm going to get rid of the exception and go back to 
what we had originally, which was int x equals integer dot parsint brad. And I am going to add a finally clause. In fact, I'm going to add a catch statement. So I'm going to catch an exception, E, and I'm just going to print it in this case. Okay, But I'm going to add a finally clause that no matter what, I want it executed. Now, I'm just going to um, say in finally so that you know that it got there. But you might use this to, for example, close a file to ensure that no matter whether the try succeeded or some exception got thrown, that some previously open file or other resource gets released. So let's go ahead and compile this code. Let's first write it and then compile it. And if we run it, you see that not only did the exception get printed, which in this case was for input string brad, but in addition, the in finally clause, the finally clause, its code got executed as well. Okay, let's change brad to be 18. So it's going to succeed. In fact, let's print out what x equals in this case. So we'll say x equals percent d percent n x. So in this case it works. The try clause is successful. It prints x equals 18, but it still printed what was in the finally clause. So that still got executed in this case. The last case to show that the finally clause always gets executed is we're not going to handle the exception. We are going to simply, no, we need the try clause still in order to have the finally, but we're not going to handle it here. We're going to handle it in, well, we're not going to handle it at all. We're just going to let the virtual machine ultimately handle it. Okay, and you can see that the final clause got executed first in this case, which makes sense because the exception got thrown right here, but it wasn't handled. So the finally clause got executed, printing in finally clause, which is what you see here. Then the exception got thrown up to main, which did not handle it. It handed it off to the virtual machine, which then printed the stack trace that you see down here. But as you can see, no matter what I did, whether I succeeded in the try, whether I caught something, an exception, and handled it in the, with the try, or whether I threw the exception out of the function, in all three instances, the finally clause got executed. So it ensures that code gets executed no matter what happens. So let's just run through a quick review of what we've seen and also uh, note the differences between Java and C++ again. So just like in C++, we have catch with a single formal parameter, but in this case, it has to be a user-defined class. Remember in C++, it could be a primitive type, although we said it really never should be. Um, it doesn't, ha and by user defined, it could be, I should really say here, or a predefined class. It is a class, is what I'm trying to get at. And then, if you're trying to have a catch all handler, you will use the exception class. Um, you should not use throwable because throwable includes error and you do not want to catch instances of error so it's exception that you want to use as your catch-all and the ellipses operator which was available in C++ as a catch-all is not available here and finally unlike in C++ the formal parameter must include the, a variable name even if that variable name is not used in the catch clause now just like C++, I didn't show it, but 
any variables declared within the try block are deallocated before the catch is executed. So if you want access to a variable, it needs to be declared outside the try block. Now, the binding of um, exceptions, or actually when we throw an exception, we have to throw an exception or an object that's been allocated off the heap because that's the only way we can create objects in Java. And here's an example throwing a bad operator exception with a constructor. Now, unlike C++, a rethrow in Java requires the original argument. So if I want to handle an exception and then rethrow it to main, I am going to have to re-raise it passing the argument I passed in. So an example will help make this a bit clear. To illustrate, let's go back to our original example where we have bvz exception and we set x equal 10. And I am going to throw a new bvz exception and I'm going to catch it and I'm going to multiply x by 2. So that should give me 20. So when I print it out here I should have e dot x is 20. And then I'm going to rethrow e. Now because I am passing a reference to an object the change I made to x is going to be reflected in this throw. So the object I'm passing up to main is my modified exception object. So it will have x equal 20. And you'll see I had to uh, declare that I was throwing bvz exception because even though I handled it in the constructor for foo, it's still throwing it out of foo, and therefore I have to tell the compiler that. Now, up here in main, I'm catching bvz exception and multiplying it by 2 again, which should give me 40. So if I actually do the compilation on that and run it, you see the first uh, print is x equal 20, which corresponds to the catch up in the foo constructor. And then down here where I recaught it, it was set to 40. So the big difference between C++ and Java with my rethrows is that I have to uh, throw the parameter that got uh, passed in, although it's okay for me to make modifications to it. Now matching exceptions is a little simpler than in C++ because we don't have reference passing. Therefore, it's simply we match any, if we throw t, then any catch clause with t as a formal parameter matches, and any catch clause that has s, with s being a supertype of t, will also match t. And that includes um, if s is an interface, it would catch it. And just as in C++, the order of catch clauses is significant. They're searched sequentially, so the most restrictive one should be first, followed by the most general ones. And if the throw is not matched locally, then it is propagated um, to the nearest enclosing try block. So here I said it's dynamically propagated up the call chain, but in fact, if there was a nested try block locally, that is the one that would be tried first. And then just like C++, after the handler completes execution, control flows to the first statement following the try construct. And also, if we throw up the call chain, the intervening stack frames are popped, although this case, we don't have any stack allocated objects that need to be deallocated, although if we have heap objects that are in the registers, then they will be written back out to memory to avoid losing them as we pop the stack frames. Remember, with C, we had that issue with variables getting potentially not updated when we did long jump because they were still temporarily stored in registers, and the long jump um, basically killed off those registers. So 
try, catch provides a structured way of popping out of the stack frames and ensuring that any variables in the registers get written out. Okay. Unlike in C++, we must uh, declare unhandled throws and as I wrote down earlier, that includes um, exceptions that are thrown out of functions that we call. So here's an example with, um, from the notes with the safe array. Range check throws an array out of bounds exception, so it declares it. And because get calls range check, even though get itself does not explicitly throw an exception, because it calls range check, it must still declare that it throws the array out of bounds error. And then finally, there is a finally clause in Java, which allows, it follows the catch clauses, and if there's no catch clauses, then it would follow the try block. It is always executed, regardless of whether the try block succeeds, or the try block throws an exception, but it is immediately caught locally, or if the uh, exception is thrown out of the function, then the finally clause is still executed. That concludes this video lecture on uh, Java's uh, exception handling. I encourage you to look at the two examples in the Java notes if you have questions about how uh, it works in specific examples. There's the equivalent of the safe array example that I did in the C++ lecture. It is very similar with just a few syntactic differences. I also have an example with a stack uh, that uses some exception handling uh, that's shown at the end of the Java exception handling notes.